please give them another hand, please. No. One of the things I love about that is the, the words of that song, it means nothing if it doesn't come from a heart that is desiring that. And one of the things the girls did to this morning is they ministered that. They ministered that to us. And the words of that song are so meaningful that every Christian here, you know, understanding the amazing love of God is such a motivation to worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And I just thank those girls for allowing us to enter into their worship experience and to be blessed by it. Thank you so much, girls. Really great job, really awesome job. I want to talk this morning about what drives you. A couple of weeks ago, we started this message and even as I sought to think about what to talk about on Valentine's Day, God brought me right back here. Because the driving force in your life will determine in so many ways how you internalize and live out your love experiences. Right now, people are very much caught up in the idea of love. I want someone to love me unconditionally and vice versa. I want someone to share life with, someone to make me feel good about myself, especially on Valentine's Day. And so much of that idea is built around me and not so much around my purpose, the purpose that God has given me. And unfortunately, because our ideas of love are built around ourselves, Many times we miss out on true love that we experience every single day from the hand of God. Let me say this, friend. Your number one valentine is God. <laughs> Why? Because God every single day pours in unconditional love into your life and you can see it every day. And if you see it and acknowledge it, chances are every day you'll be saying to God, God, thank you, I love you. And thank you for loving me. Because he is continuously showing us his love. But we're gonna miss it if the driver in our life is not God's will and God's way and God's purpose for our life. We talked about the fact that we didn't, we didn't grow up, we weren't born into this Christianity. Our lives were formed as we grew up in our households, as we grew up in our communities, developing our values. And when you come to Jesus Christ, those values don't just disappear. No, they remain in your life as a driver. Now, either God's will will supersede this. Or you will have a situation where your driver is pulling you in one direction and God is pulling you in another. And when this happens, life can become very confusing. In fact, you'll begin to look at your experience with God as, you know, is this really, I, I'm not really experiencing it the way the Bible says I should. Or is God really real? Does he really love me the way the Bible says? You will doubt everything about God if your life is being driven by two drivers. And God wants us all as his children to get to a place where there is one driver in our life. And that is God and his will and his purpose for us. Once we get to that place, everything that he commands, everything that he asks us to do will make sense. Because we'll be, we will see it as an expression of his love and protection for us. Not something that's going to take us away from the fun that life has to offer. Instead, we'll see it as something that enhances life and gives life true meaning and purpose. We covered two of them the last time. We talked about guilt and how guilt can keep you from experiencing the fullness of life. Many of us, we live our lives out of guilt. We failed. We didn't live up to people's expectations. And because of that, life becomes overwhelming and not worth living. You know, I'm so sad anytime I hear about a, a young person who did something bad and because they felt they couldn't go and speak to a parent or because they felt they couldn't go and speak to a friend. Instead, they see the only way out as taking their life. It is heartbreaking. 
Because it's a trick. The enemy will tell you guilt will keep you safe, but the enemy ultimately uses guilt to take life away from you. And God doesn't want us to live that way. That's why he's given us forgiveness. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what you've done. Through God, you receive forgiveness of sins, forgiveness for failures, forgiveness for shortcomings, so you don't have to feel overwhelmed by them. You're set free. In fact, the Bible itself says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So you don't have to live your life through guilt. The second thing we looked at was resentment and anger. And we talked about the fact that you can't live your life out of anger. Now, many of us get tricked because we think, I'm not an angry person. But anger doesn't have to be active. It can be latent. It can sit in your heart. And it can look like you have it under control until a circumstance comes up where this anger comes out and you're, un you're unable to control it. It overwhelms you. Why? Because it had a throne in your life. And it was looking for an opportunity to come out and to destroy you and to destroy the people around you. As a Christian, God has given us the ability to overcome our resentment and anger. And that is his love. His love gives us the opportunity to look at someone we might not agree with or someone who has hurt us maybe in the past and to be able to look at them through God's eyes so that we can forgive them, so that we can look at them as someone whom God loves, so I need to love them too. And the command that says that we should love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourself, that is not just something out there, but it's something that's in here, something that we live by every day. Not because we're able to, but because God empowers us to through his love and through his grace. If you're struggling with anger in your life, God's love is able to overcome that anger. And you can get rid of the driver of resentment and replace it with God's love that will help you to overcome any resentment that you have. Well, let's quickly look at the others here today. But before that, let's pray. Father, in these few moments, I ask you, help us to settle our hearts and minds, to settle in our hearts and minds who rules and reigns who is the driving force of our life help us not to be confused help us not just to add you to our life but help us to allow you to take full control not just to be our savior but to be our lord our master the one who tells us who we need to be and the one who we are trusting as we obey you and find life Father God, hide me behind the cross and speak. Expose the other drivers in our life and set us free. In Jesus' name, amen. The third driver I want to talk about is the driver of fear. Fear. Fear, I think more than any other driver, is consuming many of us now and has been consuming many of us over the last couple of years. Fear that has been brought about, brought about through the, the confusion of the politics. Fear has that, that has been brought about through fear of a disease that we cannot see. Fear that has been brought about by an economic situation that is in flux. Fear that is brought about by changes that are happening around us in our communities and in our lives. A, a change that... For many of us, we're not ready for. And for many of us, it gives us fear that we're going to have to think differently about our lives and approach things differently. Instead of addressing those fears through the word of God, many of us address those fears through our emotions. And unfortunately, it ends up with us obsessing about things that really we should not obsess about. You know, I remember as a, young, as a young guy, I made the mistake one time. 
I was about 10 or 11 years old. I went to my cousin's house and I made the mistake of watching Nightmare on Elm Street, parts two and three, one after the other. And I remember having nightmares for months because of those movies. Now I knew it was fantasy. Of course, Freddy Krueger does not exist. However, because of the way that it played upon my own fears, fears of the dark at the time, fears that maybe, just maybe, I would, something would happen in the middle of the night. I began to obsess about it, and that obsession made my fears real, and I could not sleep. If you ask my sisters right now, they'll tell you, oh man, I was annoying during that time because I felt like I couldn't sleep alone. <laughs> and that, my friends, is what fear does. It recreates reality. It makes life look like it's not worth living. It makes life look dangerous where there is no danger. It makes us feel that anything different is not just different, but it's a threat. Why would we move from that place where differences should enhance our ideas about life, not make us feel more fearful about life? How did we get there? It is because fear leads to where the devil wants you to go, and that is to a place of isolation and a place where you are ineffective in doing God's will. I know I'm talking to somebody. Fear will keep you from having a fulfilled life because fear isolates you and keeps you to yourself, keeps you from interacting with what is around you. And that is not God's will. My friend, God has given you the security of being created in his image. Why should you be afraid of anything? David he himself said, a man after God's own, own heart, David said, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? But many of us are afraid because God is not the driver. Fear is the driver. And fear will keep us from the will of God. Let me say this, my friend. If you want to have a fulfilled life, you have to address the fears in your life. And don't address them socially, exclusively. Address them spiritually, because fear is a spiritual attack. How do I address fear in my life? Well, I have to hear what God says. And the Bible makes it clear in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Let me say this, my friend. Every time fear consumes you, you are not living in the reality of God's love. And that is why it is so heartbreaking to see Christians, especially at a time when we should be peaceful and enjoying the grace of God through difficult times. Christians are losing their minds, losing their composure, losing their thoughts. The thoughts that God has filled our minds with, thoughts to help others, thoughts to encourage other people, and instead are isolating themselves, picking sides. It's heartbreaking to see because God has not created us for that. God has created us for love. And if you don't know what love is, or if you think you're still learning what love is, let me say this, God is love. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And if you struggle with fear in your life, the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. Who is perfect love? God is perfect love. So if I allow him to control my life, if I allow him to direct my life by faith, even if a lot of what he asked me to do doesn't make logical sense to me, if I allow his command to guide me, he will give me life. He will give me overcoming power over my fears. 
And I know for me, there is nothing like getting rid of the tension of fear and living freely. It makes life easier. And God is saying, if you want that kind of life, allow me to handle your fears. Fears within relationships, fears within families, fears within church, fear within, uh, fear within the, the politics, the society right now. Threats from here, there, and everywhere. Let the love of God keep your mind and heart through Jesus Christ. Don't allow the fears to consume you. Trust in the Lord. He will take you through. He has in the past. When has God ever failed you? Let him carry you through and overcome your fears by his love. Get rid of the driver of fear. And let the love and command and the will of God lead you to pastures that are peaceful and good. Places where you can be effective and happy. Fear is an enemy that needs to be destroyed. Overcome fear by God's power. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, let me say this. It's going to be very difficult to overcome fear in your life. You're going to sometimes feel strong because your emotions give you the ability to be strong one day. And then something is going to trigger another fear in you or the same fears you thought you overcame. And then the next day you will feel overwhelmed by that fear. I'm sure many of you have experienced that. One day you're good enough, the next day you're flustered, totally flustered. Why? Because only the presence of God through the Holy Spirit in your life can give you consistent victory over fear. Your conscience, your mind will fail you, but God will never fail you. He'll give you the power you need to overcome. So get rid of the driver of fear. The next thing, very quickly, is the driver of materialism. Materialism. Many of us live our lives for the things that we can get. Oh man, I want that car. I want that house. I want that husband. I want that wife. I want those kids. I want the, the, everything that we consider to be the American dream or the dream wherever you live. Many of us, we live our lives for that. And in fact, we are so materialistic that we are not only envious, for, but, for, but for many of us, we are angry with people who have the things that we want. Instead of being grateful and thankful to God for the blessings that he has given to other people, we scowl and are upset when other people get the things that we want for ourselves. How sad is that? Have you ever seen an envious person? It's a very hard person to stay around. <laughs> because instead of being thankful for what they have, they're always looking at what they don't have and they're very ungrateful. Let me say this, my friend. There are things in this life that are going to make life more comfortable for you and for me. And many of us, there's nothing wrong with attaining these things. But I can tell you this, by everything I've read and from the people I've spoken to, just because you have the things you want, that doesn't mean you're going to be happy. <laughs> In fact, some of the most unhappy people are people that most of us consider successful people. In fact, some of the most <sighs> depraved consciences, some of the most ungrateful and unthankful people are people that have it all. Why? Because instead of being grateful for the few, we're still ungrateful with the plenty. And we're ungrateful with the plenty because we are never satisfied. Materialism will blind you to the fact that there is no satisfaction. You know that old Rolling Stone song? I can't get no satisfaction. No, no, no. <laughs> That's just a guy who's being honest. <laughs> because the truth is, every pursuit of materialism in this life leads to a dead end. 
And that's why millionaires, billionaires, it doesn't matter how much money you have, they still struggle with suicide and all these other things. Because it's not about what you attain in this life for yourself materially. That's not primarily what gives satisfaction. What primarily gives satisfaction is peace of mind. Peace of mind. And guess what? There are a lot of poor people I know that are very peaceful. And you know why they're peaceful? Because God has allowed them to look at what they have, as little as it is, and to be grateful for it. The Bible says, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Why would, it, why would the Bible say that? The Bible says that because God knows how prone we are to be ungrateful. God knows how prone we are to be materialistic to the point where we're not conscious of what the materialism is doing to our, consci uh, to our conscience. That is making us ungrateful, uh, unthankful. It is making us separate from our neighbors because we're envious and, conv and covetous of their blessings. What a shame that Christians should live like that. There's no reason to. I'm not saying don't be ambitious. I'm not saying don't go after things that this life has to offer. But remember this, every single blessing of life comes from God. If it comes from God, who deserves the praise and honor whenever I attain something? God does. Who should that thing be committed to? It should be committed to God because God gave it. And I guarantee as we see the things we have through God's eyes, we will be satisfied and grateful and we won't allow these things to rule our lives to take us in directions we shouldn't go instead we will allow God to guide us and show us how these material things can be used as a blessing to the ones we love and to those who are less fortunate that's what life is all about because whether you have a lot or a little Everything belongs to God, and everything should ultimately be used for the glory and honor of God. Does this make sense? God wants us to be conscious that material things, as temporary as they are, they're just tools, tools to be used for God's glory and honor. Nothing else. Because guess what? Whether you're poor or rich, when we die, we leave it all, don't we? <laughs> Everything is left. The house is left, the car, all of that stuff. In fact, the Bible talks about the fact that you amass all these things, and then one day, all these things are taken and given to somebody who never worked for them. All these things are taken and given to somebody who may not even have been worthy of them. And that's the vanity of life and materialism. But it is also good to have the mindset that because these things belong to God, yes, of course they can be given away. If they were used for God's honor and glory and for the blessing and protection of others. That's what it's all about. Fear, materialism. Drivers that need to be gotten rid of. And let me just be clear on this. God wants us to be ambitious. God wants us to work hard. But God does not want us to worship what we attain. He wants us to use those things to bless him and to bless others. Finally, the driver. And I think this one appeals to my spirit in a very special way. The driver of the need for approval. Many of us live our lives for the need for approval. In fact, a lot of us, we, we, we don't really, we're not really honest about who we are to people. Instead, we look at the people around us and we figure out what pleases that person, what makes that person happy. And then we become that. Don't we? Yes, yeah. we look at other people, we figure them out. Oh, if I say this, they're going to smile. If we say that, they're not going to like it. And then we say, okay, well, let me be that. 
And then they're going to think I'm a good person. They're going to like me. Because we don't like it when people don't like us. Can you imagine living your whole life not being honest about who you are? <laughs> and many of us do that. And then many of us go to the next level where we are so much ourselves that we don't care about whether being ourselves is going to negatively push people away from God and from God's will. <laughs> so we're rude, we're disrespectful, we do all the things that we shouldn't do and that God tells us that we need to do. Unfortunately, many of us go to the next extent. The need for approval is a trick. Because in the end, in your need to get approval from other people, guess what gets left behind? The need for people to respect you and appreciate you for who you are. You don't want people in your life who have an impression of who you are that is false. You want people in your life who look at you, flaws and all, and love and appreciate you. Isn't that true? We all want that. We want the truth. And we want true friends. But how do we do that when we're faking who we really are? Let me say this, my friend. You might not be everything that you want to be. You might not be the most beautiful, the most handsome. You might not always say the right things. You might not be the smartest all the time. But you are perfect in God's eyes. He accepts you unconditionally. That's the guy who I want approval from. Why? Because he loves me for who I am. And that's what I want in life. I want to commit my life, to, so, to, to center my life around a love that is unconditional. And once he approves of me, I don't need the approval of every single person. Guess what? Some people are going to like me. Some people are going to hate me. And that's okay. They might like me or hate me for physical reasons or for intellectual reasons or maybe even for my spiritual beliefs. Some people might like me until I say, Jesus Christ is the way to heaven. Then they hate me. But guess what? If I am speaking the truth of God's will and God's way, if that's what I believe, if that's what I build my life around, I can still have the fullness of life and still be able to truly have joy, even if I don't get the approval of the people around me. Why? Because God's approval is all I need. Are you living your life right now for people, for their thoughts about you? Are you living your life right now fake because you can't be yourself, our own people? God is saying, you don't have to be fake with me. I'm a driver. I'm the one who will direct your life, and I love you as you are. Be yourself, but put me first. That's all he wants from us. We don't have to be super spiritual. We don't have to act in any way with God. We can be true to ourselves as long as our hearts are true to him and have him as our director. And guess what else? That attitude will help us to be open to the differences in other people. Because if God accepts me fully for who I am, I can be happy and accepting of people for who they are as well. I don't have to want to change them to love them. I can love them as they are because God loves them as they are. Amen? Yes. And it prevents us from divisiveness and all the other things that separate us from our brothers and sisters. God is saying to you today, get rid of the driver of fear. Get rid of the driver of materialism. Get rid of the driver of the need for approval from people. Live your life freely, having God at the center. I close with this. If you, as a Christian right now, are struggling with a divisive heart, with God, yes, at the center of your heart, but also your fears, your guilt, your anger, all of these things pulling against God's will in your life, 
what God is saying to you and saying to me, it's time to live for one purpose. It's time to make a decision. No, that doesn't mean that these things are just going to disappear and all of a sudden God is going to be your everything. No, it means that every day you wake up, you make a commitment to the driver of your life. You say, God, through Jesus Christ, I am going to do your will today. Your will today, your will tomorrow, your will the day after that. And as you practice that, it becomes a part of who you are. Practice becomes perfect. And God creates within you the new life, the new creation that you were created to be. If God is number one, we will be, dri be driving in the right direction. We will have the life that we seek. But it's not going to come with a divided heart. It's either God is Lord of all or he is not Lord at all. That is what it is. I pray he will be the Lord of all our lives. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word, your truth. And Lord, thank you for the time we've spent with this. You know, it's, it is important to look at this because there is sabotage that takes place in our Christian experience when we have a divided heart. And we need to have one heart, one aim, one goal when it comes to life. And that is to please you and to love you. Give us that goal, give us that heart, and prove to us that your word is true. Bless the adults here, bless the young people here to do your will and to find true life. In Jesus' name, amen.